I'm going to go over here. You lost the musical chairs games. <laughs> 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 Response. Um, welcome to Stage Source. Uh, my name is David Shane. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I am the program director here at Stage Source. And we're thrilled to have you for our Gender Explosion Forum. Uh, there have been there a committee of folks who've been working on this since before I was even here um, on how to make the New England theater community more gender inclusive. And that's going to be some of what we're talking about tonight. Um, if you want to learn more about the work that that group has been doing, you can go to stagesource.org slash gender explosion. There are some great videos, there are some tips and some resources there on that site um, to help you learn about that work and how you might engage with it more fully. Um, moving forward, I want to make you aware of a couple of things to look out for. We are in the process of developing some resources to make available to the community um, to help with the wording of casting notices. Um, uh, so that's something to, I see some nodding in the crowd, good. <laughs> so that's something to keep an eye out for, that's sort of in development and we're hoping that in January we'll have some sort of standardized language that we can make available to everybody. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, another project that we just launched, the New England Monologues Project is um, a project meant to engage New England playwrights and uh, stage source member actors uh, by providing the actors with uh, audition material that is from new plays and new work so that it's fresh for their auditions and allowing uh, those New England writers the chance to be heard in, uh, by directors and artistic directors and literary folks in those auditions uh, to help showcase their work. So um, check out that project if you're a writer or you know a writer. We are specifically looking for more material by and for trans and non-binary artists to include in that database. So definitely um, get, you know, check that out and spread it around to your networks of folks um, and hopefully we can build that a resource for the community as well. Um, this evening's forum is being live streamed on HowlRound, so some of you are watching at home, hello. Um, but it will also be available um, and archived on their site after tonight, so we will share that link with you and hope that you share it with anybody who couldn't be with us tonight so that they can also be a part of the discussion. Uh, all right, I'm gonna get out of the way. I wanna introduce you quickly to our panelists. Uh, first, to my right is Sarah Shetnoy, Managing Director of Company One Theater. Next, Mark Lunsford, who is the Artistic Producer of the American Repertory Theater followed by Sloth Levine, who is a freelance director and playwright in our community. And finally, Lilena Vogel, who is the co-director of the Underlings Theater Company. And I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for this evening. Uh, they are a playwright, actor, and activist. And I'm plugging uh, writer of the upcoming The Earth Room at Freshing Theater in May. Uh, I'm turning it over to March. Thank you. Wow, thank you for coming, everybody. So oh, nice, and thank you for all of you <laughs> watching along at home. Uh, so I'm Marge, uh, I use they, them pronouns. Uh, very excited um, for this kind of, I guess this is sort of the first public gathering of our gender explosion forum, um, uh, the initiative in general. So that's really jazzed about that. Um, I think it's worth acknowledging today, um, we're talking about uh, gender diversity in the Boston theater scene. We're talking about um, trans artists, non-binary artists, and audiences, how to bring them into spaces, um, how to get them making work, seeing work, um, and being included as a part of our uh, theater community. Um, and I think it's worth acknowledging that uh, the people in this room and on this panel today um, aren't necessarily um, we don't rep necessarily represent all of the people who are affected by and interested in this topic. For example, trans people of color. Um, we have a very white panel today. Um, but we are, having said that, very lucky to have uh, a panel of people who have made it a, uh, a goal in their career um, and a priority to be talking about this question of gender diversity. So let's get started. Um, uh, so to start off with everybody, um, what is the work that still needs to be done uh, in terms of gender <laughs> diversity? What is it? What are we talking about? Um, and what do you see as uh, where we need to go from here in the Boston theater scene? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I'll just jump right in, Mark, <laughs> he, him, his pronouns, um, from ART, and part of my job is also uh, working with Oberon, running Oberon our club space in Harvard Square. I think, um, institutionally, it's really easy on the sort of quick fixes to focus on audiences and to focus on language that's in your institution and focus on, you know, making bathrooms inclusive, and, and um, that's sort of the, the quick thing that we can all do. The work for me is about making spaces for queer and trans artists to be creating, to have their work supported, have their work seen, and to make sure that not only um, in the writing and the directing and acting, but across creative teams, we're making space and making sure that we are you know, making room for, for queer and trans artists, which I think there's still so much work to do there. Um, not to say there isn't work to be doing for our audiences as well, because of course there is, but that's for me, I think um, that sort of nurturing, recruiting, and including that um, there's still a lot of room to grow. I would add too, uh, I'm Lillian, I'm with the Underlings Theatre Company, she, hers. Um, and I would add too that it's not just about making space, um, it's also about taking time and effort and starting conversations like this one or conversations on our own internal teams to talk about how we can improve our processes and talk openly about um, gender and gender identity so we can um, actively engage with it as something that is a component of our practice um, that is integrated and thought out uh, at every step of the way when we go through putting together a production from um, our initial casting notices, certainly, but then through all the way to our publicity efforts, um, the profiles of the people that we share with our audiences, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, on the subject of sort of those quick fixes and things that are that are very visible, things that are easy to see. Um, you mentioned bathrooms, casting breakdowns. Um, what other kinds of quick fixes are sort of, are we seeing more of? Uh, I think, I mean, I think a lot of people have, are like jumping on the like normalizing pronoun usage. I'm sloth and pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, and, and doing that, you know, meetings in, um, email signatures, um, they, they're showing up a lot more, which is really great. Um, and I think that's kind of the most immediate way that um, you can get someone to start even just like understanding for themselves how their gender identity functions professionally, um, because it's so easy to just be like, okay, like I know, I know I have pronouns, put them into my email signature. And from then on, every time you send an email, you have to think about the fact that your gender is um, a tool that you are performing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I would, um, I think uh, Sarah uh, from Company One, she, her, hers, um, I think uh, definitely at the beginning of meetings, anytime you're with anyone new, normalizing, kind of introducing yourself with pronouns is a, a real easy, quick um, thing. Um, it, uh, I also think it, it helps um, kind of normalizing uh, listening to people when they introduce themselves as well, um, which is something we can all use practice at, I think, um, uh, which has been really valuable for us in, um, uh, in our different spaces that we move. Um, I think, uh, oh, I lost what I was gonna say. Um, <laughs> but I, I think um, contact sheets as well, so anytime you're doing a production, anything like that, any anytime where um, people are writing their identity in some fashion, whether that's their name or whatever it is, normalizing the practice of adding pronouns to that, um, bios and programs on, on websites. Um, those are all really easy, quick things that you do at once and you have it available in any way that you're kind of promoting, um, uh, promoting your work, but also um, talking about the artists and the people that you're working with. Um, I think it's pretty easy. So beyond that, um, how do we go about the work of bringing trans and non-binary theater artists to our theater spaces when... That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'll jump in quick and just say a couple sure. things, but I, I think one is recognizing that it's a human rights issue, um, mm -hmm. and that just like any other kind of um, active way that we're looking at diversity, inclusion, and equity in the... In the um, in the world that this is this is part of that conversation. Um, uh, I think that's the first step. Uh, and then, um, again, I think with any sort of, something that you kind of in, uh, include in the, this equity, diversity, inclusion world, 
um, thinking about um, how, they're, how the conversations are reciprocal, um, uh, being really, really conscious about um, if you're inviting artists and audiences into your space, how are you going out and reciprocating that relationship? How are you learning about the people who've been, you may be doing a, a, a work that centers on a trans artist, but there's lots of people who've been doing that for a really long time. Um, and who are they and are you engaging with them and do you understand kind of what's already being done, um, mm. I think is a kind of baseline where to start with some of these conversations. Yeah, I think that, <laughs> no, I think that, that's really um, important to remember that it's that like for some industries like theater, maybe these are new topics, but like these are communities that have existed for, you know, thousands of years, um, if not, you know, the last couple decades. Um, <laughs> but like people exist and they have a culture and they have work that they've been creating. Um, and to then put it on stage is not really just enough because there's a lot of mistranslation that can happen when you simply take someone else's story and just put it up there and then see what happens. Um, I think there's a lot of other care that has to go into how you're working with people. Sure. Yeah. So it's not just bringing trans and non-binary artists into your space, but also when you bring them in, how do you make sure they also have agency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that goes to form as well too, as much as content, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, sometimes uh, we have such rigidity in creating theater and like what it's supposed to be and how a play is made, and um, I think opening up into more of a performance conversation, which we have a lot of privilege at Oberon to like be able to do, to say to folks who are like, I don't really want to make a play, but I consider myself a theater artist and I want to do this performance, um, that we're able to support that because the space is sort of engineered in that way. And I think that has sort of led us into uh, a new world of art making and, and theater artists that is really exciting and can sort of um, let us think about our practice in a different way um, that is more inclusive of many people in general. Would you mind um, talking about a couple of examples of the sort of artists who come in and are not necessarily theater artists, but are performance artists? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the example that's like hot on my brain right now is um, Diana O, oh, who's a mm -hmm. performance artist that we're in a uh, year-long collaboration with. Um, and it started as, uh, so Diana is a performance artist, activist, um, musician, and it started as this idea of uh, having Diana in the space to do a lot of her original music, and um, we were sort of playing with My Lingerie Play, which is a piece that she did um, in New York, and then got into a further conversation about like, well, it might not be about having Diana in Oberon, it might be about Diana being with us as an institution and creating work in and around Boston in general, much in the way that she did with my lingerie play. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, we were doing, or are doing, a lot of these sort of site-specific installation pieces with Diana throughout the year, because as we started to find like what her as an artist wanted to talk about and what was important to her in the work that she was doing, it suddenly became clear it's like not just a show that comes and sits in Oberon, it's, it's something that needs to be active in the community in a much more explicit way. Um, and so we sort of used our tactics of Oberon and are taking them into these different venues across the city. Mm. Um, and then uh, uh, another great example is an artist that we just had this week named Taja Lindley, who um, is a performance burlesque artist. And uh, she came in the space and just sort of transformed it with this really incredible installation um, uh, to really make sure the audience was directly engaged in the work and activated in the work. So it wasn't just about us passively watching her performance, but that we were actively engaged and helping create the performance with her. Those are the two that are sort of right off the top of my head. But. Fabulous. I think two. <laughs> I'm hopping in. All right. Uh, I think two. Um, so Underling specializes in uh, classical works and in new plays. So when we're thinking about um, how we build inclusive communities, a lot of it comes down to saying, like, what is really crucial for us to keep in these shows? And so often um, in the works that we're doing, we're saying, uh, Shakespeare, really, we don't need to follow the exact gender politics here. It's not very inviting and welcoming. Let's spend our time getting rid of pronouns in the script, changing them. Um, right now we're in conversation um, with one of the playwrights we're working with this season, um, Alice Brayson, who's 
wonderful. We've worked with her in the past, and his. Uh, is we have an actor who uh, uses they, them pronouns and is playing a character that was written for um, someone who uses she, her pronouns. Um, so we're working with this playwright to determine whether or not it's appropriate to change the character's pronouns. Is it essential to who this character is that they be this particular gender? Um, so that's a conversation that's going on right now. Hopefully we close the script soon. <laughs> but, um, uh, it's, it's been a really wonderful and rewarding back and forth to have that conversation about um, how essential is this, and then also um, like what um, exciting opportunities can we uh, take advantage of or new resonances that can we build in our work um, by throwing out the old hat classical stuffy nonsense. That's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sloth, so yeah. you are a trans and non-binary theater artist. What? This is exciting. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, coming from that place, right? Uh -huh. Making work. Mm -hmm. um, When have you felt sort of the most supported, right, in making work as sure. a trans and non-binary theater artist? Um, I've felt the most supported when people said, what do you want to do? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Because that's when I feel like I'm actually being asked what I think as a trans person, um, rather than what I think as a trans person about someone else's cis ideas. Mm. Um, because, yeah, like, like I, I think you were, you were getting at this, Mark, that like, you can't um, just like bring in like a trans person or really any like marginalized identity and ask them to just like put their show in your theater and like just do what you've been doing but like with some flavor. Like that's just not how it works. Um, you have to, it, it, it's when um, you get to like create from that place rather than try to put that onto something else. Um, those were a lot of non-specific words. <laughs> But yeah, uh, it, it's it's when um, I'm in situations where they say, "What do you want to make?" and that's that's where I feel the most supported. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the difference uh, between being sort of open to gender diversity and other forms of diversity too, mm -hmm. um, versus actively seeking them out. Mm -hmm. I, they're different. They're very different approaches, right? Um, and I think, um, I know for us, um, I feel like right now we're creating um, in, in lots of ways different openness um, and um, trying to create as much inclu inclusive practices as possible. Um, but I will say it, is, it has not been yet um, something that we've gone out and sought after. Um, I think specifically with audiences, I think we've done a little bit more Actually, no. Um, <laughs> maybe behind the scenes. Um, I think um, some of that work has been done, but even, um, uh, and there's been some, I think, with actors, but I think there's a lot of work um, in there. In your, it's much more intentional practice. Um, uh, yeah. Um, that was kind of a non answer, but <laughs> affirming, yeah. They're very different. <laughs> I think like institutionally, I think a lot about like when are you making space for work that's already been created. This is sort of what Sloth was saying, and in, in, in a presentational way. And when are you actually going to an artist and supporting their process and what they need to make, and making the time for that to happen in the right way and, and in an honest way that you know gives it the same resource that you would give to any other artist. And, and that's what I think about institutionally. I think. Um, <clears throat> It's really easy to get into a, a, a space where you're like, well, this I saw this really great play that was written by this trans person. We're just going to put it in our season, and like, what I don't know what that's accomplished necessarily mm -hmm. um, because it, there are great things about that, and certainly in terms of representation. But I think the the work is in nurturing and developing and giving access to all the same resources as any other mm -hmm. artist. And when and I, that always makes me ask the question when I like see someone. Is like, oh, we were doing a play that was great last season in someone else's city that was written by a trans writer. Um, then I'm always like, okay, so the, the writer's not here anymore. We've taken their play. 
have we hired a trans director? Are there actual trans people in the cast? Has anyone trans touched this production or are we just interpreting um, someone's words? Um, that's kind of, that also feels very much like, um, that's when I know that you're trying to like get some brownie points for by doing a trans play, um, but you're not trying to pay or support any new trans people that actually live in your city. Um, and I feel like that's a really important aspect of doing the work and trying to create inclusion. I think too, um, we're all empowered here as audience members and economic decision makers to give our money to those things that match our values. Um, so, you know, when we're thinking about how we spend our funds for the season, uh, we're thinking too, like, oh, if we have money left over, do we go and make a donation? What artists do we support? Who do we help financially as best we can as a teeny tiny fringe theater collective um, to encourage their own artistic and professional growth? Great. <laughs> <laughs> we went down the line. <laughs> that was really interesting. Uh, okay, um, so diving a little bit into sort of the way we build institutions, what can we be doing on a structural level as well, like to have trans people sort of at every level of making theater? Um, how can we integrate these ideas into hiring practices, company culture, bringing people to boards and onto staffs? I think I've been waiting for this question, I was hoping that you would mention it. Um, and I think in our case, um, we learned a painful lesson about not incorporating um, questions around gender identity and gender inclusivity in our hiring practices. Um, we worked with a designer in the past who wasn't very inclusive and didn't use inclusive language and was harmful to some of the existing relationships that we've used. So when we're going through and interviewing with designers, we treat it as like a must talk about topic. Talk to me about um, the diverse populations you've worked with in the past. Talk to me about um, trans and non-binary actors, performers, or co-workers that you've worked with in the past. If you haven't, what reading have you done? What work have you done to engage yourself and educate yourself about this topic? Um, we have learned that we will not work with people who are not willing to go out and learn. Um, that that is essential to our practices. And I'm like, of course, disappointed that we learned it in a painful way for some of the people that we worked with. However, the um, important thing for us was that we shifted and turned very quickly and immediately said, thank you for telling us this was wrong. We're going to go adopt it and implement it as part of our practice universally. I think for us, um, confronting audiences who use damaging language has been a um, uh, uh, learning experience. <laughs> you know, I think. Um, uh, in particular, institutionally, you can get such geared into a, a place of hospitality, and you have to take care of your audience and welcome them into your space, and they're spending money, and you know they're an important part of why the work exists. <laughs> but at some point, if they are using language, or um, this happens to us in particular at Oberon because they're so on top of the work, um, that has to be confronted in a very specific way, and, and it has to send a message to other people in the room that this is a value for us, and we truly stand behind it, and we have to address it in the moment. Um, and I think that can be tricky uh, if you have been, you know, sort of engineered to caretake for your audience. To say like, well, no, I have to make it clear to you that this is not in line with our values, and it's not in line with the values of the space. And you know, we need you to either engage in a longer conversation with us about why that is important to us, um, or respectfully ask that you not come back. Yeah, I'll second that. We've. Um had very in-depth conversations with audience members um, that have either, mostly that have left during a, a show. I don't think we've ever had a confrontational issue during a performance that I can think of. Um, most people leave and then have a confrontational <laughs> confrontation in the lobby. Um, uh, but we, when, um, uh, oftentimes, most of, I think most of our shows, we anticipate there being some sort of um, moment of confrontation with an audience member. Um, in that talking to our staff and our lobby staff about how to how to talk about that and um, it isn't uh, necessarily taking care of the audience member it's being respectful in your conversation but being real with your values um, and that it's really okay if you don't come back um, 
know, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for letting us know, and I'm happy to have a great life. And it's all, we're good. <laughs> and there are many times those conversations that do become really fruitful yeah. and great learning experiences for yep. audience, which is, I think is an important piece of doing the work, yep. uh, but also times it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and as, as far as like getting trans people to like multiple levels of, of theater production, um, that one I, is one that I would love to see addressed more in the future because as a trans person who is the only one who doesn't have like a company affiliation up here, um, that feels really stark to me. Um, and it often feels that like as trans artists we're asked to do the trans project or um, that, you know, come on, talk about our identity, and then um, move on. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels like, to me, that's what keeps like actual change from happening, because people do their one show and then say bye. Um, and if those decisions continue to be kept being made by trans people, then um, I think trans people would be considered more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were part of people making the decisions, right, yeah. about who's coming into the space. Mm -hmm. um, what are some other obstacles and challenges? Um, well, Elena, you talked a little bit about something that didn't work. Do we have other examples of <laughs> things we've seen not work um, and what we've learned from that? I don't know if this ca it counts really as not working, but it was definitely something that made us think, and it, it mm -hmm. provided some really great conversations with mm -hmm. audience members. Um, when we were at the Strand Theater this summer, um, we uh, did gender inclusive bathrooms, um, but had a lot of, and we've done this at multiple venues, um, but this in particular, the show um, brought in a lot of uh, young audiences, um, a lot of um, middle school and high, uh, specifically elementary, middle school, high school students. Um, and we hadn't thought through that um, all the way. Um, and I think uh, that provided some really interesting conversations with the group leaders who would come in and say, hey, it's, like, it's great that you're doing this, but I feel really uncomfortable when someone's using the urinal in a particular restroom and having um, somebody who feels uncomfortable in that situation walking in. And I was like, that's, I hadn't thought about, um, not that I hadn't thought about that at all, but I hadn't thought about that with someone who's under 18 mm -hmm. and how that impacts the group leader um, and how that, um, how that, how, what kind of conversations we need to have um, internally before um, we do something like that again. Um, and not that we would, you know, we're not gonna step back on making restrooms gender, gender inclusive, but what, what else we need to do, because we also need to create safe spaces for everybody who's, um, who's coming to the show. Um, so that was, that was really, that was definitely something that I was like, okay, so this is the next step in terms of what are we doing? And really, um, I think providing, I think we, we did a lot of work on the, uh, uh, creating um, general inclusive restrooms at mo most of our venues. There's still some that are <laughs> challenging. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I also think we're not talking to our audiences well enough about it. We're not explaining why it's so important um, and why, um, why it's a value of the organization. Um, and so that's something we're thinking about too. Mm. Next steps. Yeah, that's the thing I wonder about too. Like how do you when you have the audience in the room, if they don't, if they're not necessarily on the same level of this conversation, like if they're not ready to talk about mm -hmm. pronouns, well, I mean, I think everybody's ready to talk about yeah. pronouns. <laughs> <and race. laughs> but it, it, if, if they've never been introduced to these ideas mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Well, it's about, it's about representation too, though, where, like, Sloth was, like Sloth was saying, you're doing the work and then have a bunch of, you know, cis men designing the show mm. who maybe aren't necessarily engaged with the themes of the show or willing to have that kind of conversation it can be really um, detrimental and I think we have found sometimes having creative teams who haven't maybe spent the time with the material or haven't really um, explored the themes or explored deeper conversations can be really problematic to the creative process. Mm. And what ways are you finding, this is sort of a question for everyone, um, what ways are you finding to establish those vocabularies with your creative teams, um, designers, actors, staffs? Um, how are you going about sort of establishing that vocabulary and having a, a place where you can all go from together? 
I think we're in a very fortunate position because we are just getting started in, in our second season right now where we're thinking about how we build it in from the very beginning. Um, so one of the things we've started doing um, is well, the first time that we gather our cast and gather our staff together, we talk about our pronouns and we talk very openly um, about the company's values and its mission and why it is that we discuss pronouns at the beginnings of our meetings, why we included them on the audition form, um, why we put out like um, gender blind casting notices, etc. Um, so you know each of our people has an understanding of the um, the values that we live by and the values that we practice by so that they can take them as a toolkit and apply them to their own work, um, especially their work with us. Talking, lots of talking. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, I think also um, being really open to being challenged. Um, so um, making sure you're putting your values out there and then being really open about when someone's saying, hey, I, I actually don't see you guys doing this, um, is really like, is super important. And um, we've learned a lot from that <laughs> and can continue to. We are by no means <laughs> done with this work. <laughs> as no one is, so. <laughs> um, yeah, lots of listening and talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and where do you all see sort of, as individuals and as part of the uh, members of the organizations that you're part of, what do you see as your next steps? I think we could use um, an opportunity to focus on the topic um, to turn over some of the leadership that we have in the organization and hand it over to people who, like myself and the co-directive underlings, are not cisgender. Um, <laughs> and instead are talented and wonderful trans and non-binary people. Uh, we'll talk later, this is my point. <laughs> Well, maybe that's the next step. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't know. That's that's the tricky thing about being trans is that it's not up to me to hire the trans person until until someone asks me to hire people for them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, you know, I just I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. Or unless you need to hire people. Yeah, at least a little bit about those for us. Yeah, so I mean. I, I honestly, I found that like um, getting the work done that I want to do has, as it often is, like whether or not I'm trans, like I'm just a young theater maker. Um, make producing your own work is kind of how it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and so I recently um, produced, um, directed, and wrote my own adaptation of Nosferatu, um, Nosferatu the Vampire. It happened this past Halloween. Um, and in that, um, I don't know how much of this was conscious and how much of this was just how I operate as a person, but um, from the get-go, it was a really um, queer and trans-inclusive piece. Um, starting from just like the way that the script was written, um, I was trying to tell a story about people that didn't have um, traditional gender um, and trying to talk about what is scary for <coughs> for trans people. Um, so, f and just going from there, it meant that the people that I wanted to work with had to understand what those fears were. Um, and that's, a lot of those people were trans. So um, <laughs> that's just kind of how that happens. Um, and again, that's starting from what the work you're trying to make is and who you're trying to talk to and about. Um, and if you want to do it correctly, who's, who are the right people? to be in the room with you. Yeah, I mean, commissioning is what I think about a lot mm -hmm. in terms of how work gets developed um, and how you're spending commissioning resources. I mean, it's like a big investment that we make as institutions and, and, and being generous with that and, 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 and um, honest and, and supporting that work uh, when it's commissioned. Um, and I think just like always challenging, always thinking about the play that you're working on, and even if it is not a play that is about gender, still challenging 
the characters that are in the play or the themes mm -hmm. that the play is dealing with always and not sort of taking your eye off the ball just because it's not the immediate content that you're dealing with in the piece. Um, that's, I think, as an artistic team at ART, we're trying to make sure that we're always questioning, like, is that necessary? Is it appropriate? Can we think of it this way? It's very similar to the first point you made about, like, is it important that this character be gendered female or, or not? Um, and always doing that regardless of what the play is talking about specifically. Yeah, I think um, there's a, a couple of things. I think one of the one of the things we're actively doing right now is developing a list of questions to ask ourselves um, for every project we're working on. That is um, challenging our own assumptions about how we're approaching um, a, a lot of some of its logistics um, and just making sure that you know if if, if a, because we move venues a lot, a lot of what we're thinking about all the time is how we're how is this venue we're walking into approaching um, this issue? Have they thought about it? What are, we, what are we walking into? What are the conversations that they're not having that we need to, to introduce to that um, institution? Um, uh, even so much as like, we, had a, um, we had something that kind of made me, uh, we had two things that happened this summer that kind of made me rethink, and this is kind of where this set of questions came from, is, is that um, somebody who identified within the LGBTQ community was, um, was saying, why is it always me who's asking this question? It's not necessarily, um, bad, I'm not asking it for it to be different, I just want to acknowledge that this is something that happens all the time. And I said, you're totally right. <laughs> um, why is it that you are the one who is asking this all the time? And I think it's not just within the LGBTQ community, I think it happens in any historically marginalized community and it's something that we, especially as institutions who are run by cisgender white um, individuals, need to be talk like uh, challenging ourselves about all the time on every single thing we're doing. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things. Just being much more conscious about it for um, as we move forward. And then um, there was something else I was thinking about, and I can't remember what it was right now. But um, well, I well okay. Um, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think it's again that, that intentionality and that and that challenge is you know in the programming you're doing in um, who who are you asking uh, who are you inviting into the conversation or what what work you're doing. Um, uh, funders. That was my next conversation. That that feels like a big next step that the that as nonprofit organizations and as a field we need to figure out. I'm still filling out forms for funders that are done in a binary way, um, which just feels like the easiest thing to fix. Um, and then there's all the hard work that has to happen. Um, so that that's a huge thing um, that I think we again I think with every marginalized community in this country. Um, we need to be having conversations with uh, who controls the, the money around all of that, uh, but this one feels um, feels per very particularly easy to fix that is, I don't know what's why it isn't um, done mm. in a different way. And the unions, I would say, yeah. on top of the funders, <laughs> I think, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, getting unions to be in this conversation with us um, uh, is a huge, piece of it because mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like I'm always filling out audition surveys. They're like, how many men and how many women did you audition? I'm like, what? Okay. Right. So uh, that's, that's another yeah. one that comes up for me a lot. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we have a lot of time. I was wondering, maybe we can open things up to the audience. If anybody in the audience has any questions, and I'll kind of pick you and then whoever from the panel wants to answer, can go ahead. Yeah. Actually, I wanted to, to know a little bit more, but for either uh, Sarah or Mark, about the audience members that are having sort of difficulty that you're having uncomfortable conversations with. Mm -hmm. Could you give an example of, of like an incident that happened, number one, and then, um, and just is it just a matter of that people didn't quite know what to expect and they were surprised, or what, what's, what's going on there with the audiences? Mine always come in restaurant conversations, I feel. I don't yep. know. I mean, I, I would say that's anyway. the majority of them right now. I think it's different than it was 10 years ago. Um, I mean, this has happened forever. And I think, again, it isn't always around gender identity. It's around lots of different things. But um, yeah, it's around audience expectation seems to be the biggest thing other than the restroom issue. Um, is uh, I thought this was one thing. You've just challenged my values in a way I am totally uncomfortable with. How could you do that? I'm so mad. <laughs> and I'm like, it's theater. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
<laughs> that's like our mission. And uh, if you read anything about this play, I don't understand why you came if you were going to be that bad. Anyway, uh, that that's like the tenor of a lot of them. I, I think the. I have um, a couple of the restroom specific examples, but I will say I, I don't remember, none of them have actually been um, super confrontational, but I know some of the ones that um, have been. Um, they've all been really um, kind of opening, uh, opening up audience members to, I'd never thought about that before, why do you do that? Why do you do that is actually the biggest question I think we get from lots of audience members. So that's one of the things where we're like, we aren't doing a good enough job at talking about why we do this um, and why this is important. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's mostly the tenor of what it is. Um, it's, I would say the most confrontational things have not been around gender identity, it's been around politics and um, values um, and people just being really mad that we made them think differently. Yeah, I, I think anything that leads into a conversation with an audience member about um, gender as a construct, as a performance, <laughs> like really, like it suddenly becomes like not about the bathroom or the bathroom safety. Yeah. It's that like you have now waded into this very what could be for them abstract notion, yeah. and so then it's a very uncomfortable place to be. In particular, if you're like in the lobby at the low Sorry, <laughs> you know, like that's not necessarily the place maybe you thought you were going to have that conversation, and it can get very sort of tense very fast. Um, but I, I have to echo what Sarah's saying that. I would say, by and large, once you engage in the conversation mm -hmm. in a very sort of respectful and safe way, it, it, it always proves to be positive. Not always. Not always. <laughs> um, <laughs> to my surprise, it proves positive yeah. more often than not. Um, <clears throat> but there, there are still moments that it doesn't. And I, um, I'm always you know, confounded by it because I, we, we presented this artist named Shakina Nafak, trans woman, and I had so many people come to her show, have a great time, and be so upset about the all-gender restrooms. Mm -hmm. And I sort of, <laughs> I, I just thought like, yeah, well, that's real. I don't, you know. <laughs> Clearly you're engaged in the conversation, and the central tenet of the show mm -hmm. is about <laughs> Shakina's journey. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to me that this is the argument that, or the, the confrontation we have to have. You know, um, because I would have assumed, mm -hmm. clearly and correctly, that you were ready and willing to engage in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, you know, find that, find that interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, I have a question specifically for Sloth. Um, do you feel like there is open communication between um, being a trans and non binary artist um, mm -hmm. between yourself and theater companies, or do you feel like that communication isn't there. Um, who's making the first move? Does it have to be you? Is it the, the companies? How are, are you finding that relationship working? Um, do you do you mean um, as far as like finding a job, or once I'm in a job and just like in communication with who I'm working with? I guess both in a way. Sure. Um, you know, when those opportunities come up, like. <laughs> Again, who's making the first move? Like, is it you putting yourself out there? Is it the com Are you waiting for companies mm -hmm. to make that move? Um, and once you're there, like, you know, are you just kind of wandering around with people afraid to ask you your pronouns, or? Do you <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, well, I guess the first thing I say is that I don't know who's afraid to ask me because they don't talk to me, um, which is really great. People who are transphobic are usually really good at like self-selecting out of talking to me, which I appreciate. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true, um, but I feel like, one, I've been very lucky in that I've worked almost exclusively with people who are, if not um, super educated, really willing to learn and get better and talk. Um, I've never, um, so far, knock on wood, really come up against a company that I felt like actively like unsafe in talking about my gender with. Um, but I do also think um, I've almost never gotten a job that has been posted and I've applied for. Um, it's only ever been things that I ask for. Um, so that's kind of really been how I, as a trans person, I mean, honestly, I don't know if that's because I'm trans or not. Um, that's not really for me to, to figure out. Um, but I don't feel that I've really gotten any of the opportunities because, um, of a door that someone else opened and I said, I can walk through it. It was me saying, can I open this door? Um, and I feel like that's also applicable to any kind of 
um, situation where you you really have to find it to just like to advocate for yourself, um, and then hopefully people will follow suit. And then if they don't, then you just go somewhere else because someone else is going to say yes. Mm. Yeah. I can speak to this a little bit too because I'm also a, a young trans theater artist. Um, is that part of it? Is that when you're a young theater artist, like you do have to hustle and like you do, <laughs> you do have to put yourself out there a lot. And it is hard to know like when when people say no to you. Like, is it because of a lack of experience? Is it because they don't know you? Like, is it because you're trans? Like, those are questions we might never know the answers to as individuals. Um, this made me think of. Um, a, of data. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, like, it's so hard to find data, right, about like <laughs> how communities are being represented. I someone think I didn't mean numbers? <laughs> about the work of, of gathering data. That's something I think about all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. We've done yeah. audience surveys, like handwritten audience surveys for 20 years, and it's gone through different iterations with asking people different questions and Demogra how are you asking about demographic information like this? Um, we started just using blank lines and we're, we're like, we want you to talk about your gender here. And that's new, that's only, I think, been just last season we did that. Um, it's been really fascinating, um, the breadth of, of answers and how people <laughs> identify. Um, and, you know, we're thinking, I'm, I'm also, with having to fill out all these really fun demographic sheets for funders, um, really thinking about how are we asking um, our staff, our board, um, where are we asking these kinds of questions? If, when I fill these out, my guessing, which is, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm guessing things. So, um, how do we create an um, uh, atmosphere where it, where people feel safe to answer this question honestly? Um, is something I think about a lot. <laughs> We've done that with gender and race, or the two things, or race and ethnicity. I think I defined it as race and ethnicity, or I think I have a whole bunch of things. Like, however, you want to talk about this with us. Um, we're very interested in the nuance of it because I oftentimes we're not given the opportunity to be um, to have a nuanced answer um, mm -hmm. to those things which I think is super important it's just interesting too um, in the sort of conversation about gender that like the terms are constantly changing the terms is in the yeah. literal vocabulary that we're yeah. using mm -hmm. um, sort of you know, non-binary as a word, I, I don't know exactly how long it's been around, so nobody like quote me on this, <laughs> but like in general usage is a relatively new term for us to be using. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully at some point it'll not have to be non something else, right? Like right. Mm -hmm. let's, we've, we've stopped using the word non-white because it's really white centric and that's problematic. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we, how do we create that? And, and my guess is in five years, non-binary actually probably won't be used. And that will have evolved to something that feels uh, not binary centric. Um, yeah. Yeah, it does definitely feel for me like the word non binary specifically. Um, nine times out of ten, if someone asks me what my gender is, I'm going to say, well, I'm non binary. And that's not because, like, that's a noun that is my gender. It's because that's the easiest way mm -hmm. to describe it to a cis person, right. is to just give them a third option. Um, <laughs> like, but like, yeah, but the term non-binary is not in and of itself a gender, it's just a description. Right. Yeah. Yeah? Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit, or you, guys, you all have talked a little bit about like the fact that there's not that much like leadership that is being offered to trans people or that trans people are not in a lot of leadership and like we definitely need to move more towards that but while that's still the case what what specifically do we ask of our staffs when taking care of like trans actors or directors or creators in any way like what how do we make sure that <coughs> they are doing that support that we're saying they're supposed to do like what does that support look like in the case of like various types of theater right like and what do you do when like maybe an actor is 
expressing discomfort with something or or a concern with something that maybe like the request is out of the norm of what a theater production does or out of the norm of what your company has done like what do you do with that and how do you make sure that that's happening successfully it, I think it's in the training and the listening um, you know I think um, as is the case with audience members who may question uh, gender inclusive restrooms I think there's a lot of staff members who you just haven't engaged in a conversation about gender, but the minute you talk to a staff or talk to a group of artists about like, this is important to us, it's, it, fortunately, in my experience so far, it's been a pretty quick evolution. Like, oh, of course. And also, here are all the things I could be doing to make sure I'm instilling that my own team. Um, I'm not sure that's the overwhelming case, but <clears throat> for us, it was uh, specifically about taking the time to sit down and be like, this is why we talk about pronouns. This is why it's important to change the restrooms. Just even that sharing of information, um, I think, took a big step into raising it as an important value institutionally. Were you I was, but Great, so you go first. first. Okay. Um, so, the backstage version of bathrooms, right, like dressing rooms, have been really interesting for me as a trans actor because I'm not particularly comfortable in like either a men's dressing room or a women's dressing room. And, uh, a lot of the time, I am the person who has to bring that up, right? Like, I have to go to the stage manager or whoever's in charge and say, like, hey, I need to have a discussion about which dressing room I'm going to be in. Um, and if they're gendered, like, I usually make the choice to go with, like, the one that has a person who I feel safe with, things like that. But I definitely think, like, talking to your actors about which dressing rooms they would prefer, like, it, even for cis actors, like, it's, it's, that's an, I think that's an important conversation to have. Mm -hmm. So that's one small thing. Mm -hmm. There's 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 ways like that, like not waiting for your actor to come to you to ask about where they can feel safe. Um, where if you've if you've done the work beforehand, it's really easy to show your actors, creative team, whoever, whatever your employee is, that you've done the work to like try to make them feel safe. Um, which will lead to a conversation about like what steps to take because there's not always going to be a one-size-fits-all answer for everything but if you are able to like anticipate what the question is going to be you don't necessarily need to have the answer but it's very easy to show someone that you've already thought about it because you just have to think about it <laughs> <laughs> and also I'll, I'll say i think one thing the that now that i like after i thought about it after it happened it wasn't surprising to me but um Thinking about when a um, cisgender actor uh, then comes to you and is like, "Why are, are is this ha like? Why is someone in their own space? Why um, are we treating this differently? How? Why, why is this a different space than what I'm used to?" That's happened um, a few times with us, um, and I'll I'll also say like that again that I think translates out to um, any traditionally marginalized community that you're working with. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's an interesting conversation to have with cis, I'll be real about it, cisgender white male um, uh, artists and um, staff, um, and being really thoughtful about how you're, it, it's not about coddling them, it, it's about actually engaging in the conversation, um, and thinking through how that, how is that conversation going to happen, because it will, um, mm -hmm. and how are you being thoughtful about it ahead of time. I, I think there's been a practice institutionally for many years, too. <clears throat> thinking about the LGBTQ as a unit. And so when <laughs> these institutions have, yeah. you know, tons of white sister and gay men, they, they feel like it's a box ticked, mm -hmm. and the intersectionality of that conversation is like totally gone. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> the gay white men who are in those positions are not challenging that either, or facing the transphobia in the community themselves. Um, and so I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have people actually So it's like, oh, we're we're doing great with the LGBT community. Yeah. It's like we've actually just hired a bunch of white gay guys. So <laughs> about you know, now it's a problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this question would be kind of for everyone except for Sloth, because you made that very clear. But one thing I'm finding as a theater artist who's predominantly an actor, um, that I 
feel as though where this conversation is coming up more and more often, which on one level is great, I almost feel as though I'm also being further marginalized. Like if somebody sees that my pronouns as a human and actor are they them theirs, then their assumption is like, therefore the characters they will want to play are only they them theirs. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I would prefer to be kind of seen as a shapeshifter or like open to being able to play more roles and not then be pigeonholed significantly more. So are there any measures that you guys, that you three know of that are preventing you from y y making assumptions of the people who walk into the audition room? So I think one thing that we do, um, of course, like on all of our audition forms, we ask, um, what roles are you interested in? And we take that very seriously, but um, when we see an actor who is wonderful for a role that we, that they themselves didn't come into audition for or that we had um, found ourselves writing them out of, we have a conversation with them and say, hey, would you be interested in reading for this character? I think you have a lot of their qualities. Um, let me know. Um, so it's a back and forth and an exchange. Um, I think, too, for us, um, you know, our leadership um, has done a lot of work with, um, I totally lost that thought. It's gone. <laughs> 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 um, but I guess, I guess um, uh, one of the things that we think about is um, being really conscious um, so that when we, we catch ourselves when we're screwing up and making mistakes um, and doing our best to apologize when we see that we're making a mistake before someone says that they're hurt or are harmed. Um, so, you know, that's like, that's crucial. Owning your mistakes mm -hmm. and being like, I'm a screw up. <laughs> I know it. Um, and I can do better. Um, it comes up a lot with musicals and ensembles in particular mm. um, uh, for us you know and and saying like what well, it's not just because we thought that the ensemble was six men six women to do partner dancing it doesn't feel <laughs> like we need to get rid of that <laughs> right like what are the voices you need what are the ability you need and then cast that ensemble and have a conversation later about do you feel drawn to a specific character in this ensemble that has a gender identity do you not sort of just throw away that. But that to me is like, especially in ensemble musical casting, the like very quick fix, easy thing. You know, it doesn't have to be gendered in that way necessarily. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work to do um, in terms of, and as far as companies go, um, especially those of us who are commissioning new work. Um, uh, uh, talking to playwrights is a big part of it too. I, th I think what's really interesting to me, and I think where the conversation's gonna end up going, is a very similar track. Um, uh, with the difference, the very specific and intentional difference between colorblind casting and color conscious casting. Mm -hmm. And where does this conversation, uh, where is this conversation in the evolution of very similarly to that conversation? Um, and where is that conversation with organizations, playwrights, and, and actors in the whole community? Um, because I think that conversation is further down the road uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit, <laughs> um, than, um, than thinking about it with gender identity. Um, and I think there's a it's the long game. I think that conversation's the long game. Um, but um, it, there's, yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer. There's, there's a lot of work. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Hi. So one question that I have is, so we've talked a lot about classical work. We've talked a lot about new work. What do we do with, like, kind of the new modern canon? Mm -hmm. um, because I recently had an experience where I released um, a casting notice with gender inclusive casting and uh, we got dinged from Samuel French saying, hey, you can't do that. And I said, yes, we can. Yeah, I forgot about that. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> like, I absolutely can. So it's that, it becomes that question of when we're dealing with then living playwrights, mm -hmm. how does that change? And they're not living playwrights in our community, they're living playwrights who are you know, not to name names, Tom Stoppard. Um, <laughs> what exactly, what, well, what exactly then do we do? How are we going to um, determine kind of what our definition of inclusivity is going forward? Yeah, I mean, this is an industry thing. Yeah. Like, we have to take it on as, a, as an industry. It's the only way it's exactly. going to change. Um, 
I think again, it, it's thinking about how each of those, each of the people within our community, each of the groups of um, individuals in our community are going to take ownership of this. It's a, it's a huge thing for um, organizations to talk to playwrights when they're commissioning work, right? Like eventually, hopefully, this won't be as big of an issue as it is now. Um, but you know, I think so we've gone down the road a couple times of like challenging Sam French's you know, or whatever. Uh, um, uh, uh, however they're putting it out and they're gonna get mad at us if we do something different and gone down the road of like talking to the agents and everything else and it's hard, um, it's really, really hard. Um, so I think it, it is a matter of like all of us being very conscious of it and like why does that, why do we break all, like the first thing all the playwright, all the plays do is break down by gender and it's just male and female and that just is like, why is that such a big thing at the beginning of every, uh, uh, you know, part in Sam French's catalog? Why, why does that, not, I shouldn't single them out because everyone, it, everyone does it. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I think it's up to the, the Lort theaters to start talking about it. It's up to the, the community theaters, everybody on every level. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> More work, yeah. but not, like super, it's like super necessary, and feels like something that's like really easy to fix, right? Like yeah. this doesn't seem that cha that challenging. Um, but I also think it gets down into um, if we can be intentional about it, if players can be really intentional about it, and we've kind of been we've had that open conversation about it, and they're intentional about it, will we see a bigger diversity in how if we're going to still go down this route of like we're defining gender for our characters and our plays, are we seeing more diversity within that? Um, so yeah, I think it gets back into that like long, long winding road conversation, um, but yeah, so necessary. Can I ask a follow up? Yeah. Was the casting notice that um, the characters are listed by gender and you removed the gender so that people could, or was it that you added language that just said all gender I just added, I gave the pronouns to the characters and how we would put the pronouns to the characters cool. and then said all genders will be considered and one particular character, I said I'm looking for someone who presents as genderqueer. I'm looking for somebody who, you know, has a visibly queer presence. Mm -hmm. And that was what was in the casting notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, it's two steps for me. Like, the first one is simply including language that's like inviting yeah. genderqueer folks to audition for your play. It's like, not a problem. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's a problem. It's like, okay, <laughs> we need to have a larger conversation here. But then the next step of that is, to your point about the living playwright, <clears throat> and being able to engage them in conversation, mm -hmm. so like, I know you wrote this play 20 years ago, but here's what we're thinking about now, and you're hitting on the themes and the yeah. content, yeah. even if you haven't named it specifically in the gender of character, mm -hmm. and we invite you to think about this with us and like approach this in a different way, and I think if they're not hip to that, then they're not aligned with the values that mm. theater can move on. Yeah. And if they won't listen to that, then they <clears throat> lose a production of their play, mm -hmm. they lose a whole group of artists who would have come to have a relationship with it, and a whole audience who would have had a relationship with it. And plenty of other people are going to do their play. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean that's, one of, that's, that's one of the yeah, hard parts about it, is that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but when, you know, when the bigger theaters start demanding that things change, um, mm -hmm. and that, you know, is an is a industry conversation that's happening, you know, it's not just the small productions um, here and there, that's, that's when it will change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was, this is kind of a half-baked question, I'm going to try and make more <laughs> sense. Um, so you, uh, you had mentioned that there was a situation in which uh, having a gender-free restroom was uncomfortable with a younger audience. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's um, really important to talk about how we address gender inclusivity with young audiences mm -hmm. as an elementary school teacher myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if anyone has ideas um, about the way that you can either incorporate this in your companies, how to not punish and sexualize yep. gender inclusivity with young audiences, and specifically for Sloth, is there suggestions that you can give these companies <laughs> in ways that you would like to see that done as well as a panelist? Uh, well, okay, no? so, there's, no, so there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of things here. Um, for, I mean, like, I mean, I'm not all trans people, so. I can't speak for all of us, but um, as so I, I, I approach this in, in two ways, where I 
one of the things I love to do is to get it for young audiences. Um, I, I really like it. Um, I've done a lot of it. Um, but also I'm not a teacher, so, and I like, kids make me nervous. So, like, <laughs> so like, the action, I, I personally hesitate to like answer, like, I know what to do in the classroom full of kids in the back room. Um, cause what I do is leave. Um, yeah. So as far as like what the kids are seeing on stage, I think it's really easy for kids to understand gender. Um, they, they just get it a lot quicker. They don't care until you tell them to care. Um, like I've, I don't know, I've done, I, I did a production of The Hobbit while I was in college where there were two men in the cast. It was a lot of queerness going on, a lot of fake beards on women. Um, and the kids liked it. Like, they, they don't care, they see the dragon and dwarves. Like, they buy into it and they understand that um, you can do whatever you want and it doesn't matter what your, your gender is. Um, Yeah, but the bathroom question's tricky. Um, and it's hard as a trans person to sometimes like want to make that space for yourself because you know that so many people are gonna like turn that into a safety issue or make you feel like dangerous to children, which is like absolutely not the case. Um, but it is really hard to um, come to consensus. I've rambled, yeah. No, it's okay. And I'll clarify one point. The the issue was actually the urinals only. Like, they actually didn't have an issue with the gender inclusivity, okay. but it was the, the urinals specifically, which I think we just never, I hadn't thought yeah. about. Yeah. Um, and that, frankly, is, like, it can be an issue. And I, well, I've seen a lot of, a lot of spaces that have, like, when especially, yeah. it was like, this was formerly a men's room and this was formerly a And we do room. that and we you say, say yeah. you just say, you know, gender free bathroom with urinals, gender free bathroom without urinals. And that's what, yeah, we yeah. do. And I've also seen other spaces just literally just tape off the urinals and just say, we're not, we're just not going to use this. And I think that's something we'll probably move forward with. Mm -hmm. um, we just hadn't thought, I just hadn't thought about that specifically. And it was, it was actually a great conversation because he didn't have an issue with the whole concept, which was which was nice, <laughs> so we we can actually be nuanced about the conversation and say this this aspect of it was um, challenging for us. And I was like, that actually, you know what, that that's a really good point. And um, yeah, it was nice to have a, a nuanced conversation about it. When well, I think I think privacy at a restroom <clears throat> can be important for many other reasons, regardless yeah. of gender. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so, uh, for us. But one of the things that comes up a lot with the with the degendering of restrooms is like, well, it's too expensive to get rid of the urinals. Like, <laughs> yes, it is. Um, you're right, <laughs> but it, that you don't have to. Um, you can do this yeah. this exact move and yeah. just say like, this is a restroom that has this equipment, this restroom has this equipment. But for us, it was um, when we remodeled our restrooms. It was also just having a private one stall private restroom mm -hmm. for families, for people with medical yeah. issues who might want to have privacy, and so that there are two rooms that have multiple stalls, multiple urinals, and then also a, a one complete private room mm -hmm. um, that you know was important for a host of reasons mm -hmm. um, that I think come up for folks beyond gender. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to make this question bathroom centric. But like I've also oh, had this sure. in, in in dressing rooms as well. Like I, yeah. as a trans actor, have been. You know, in a dressing room with a cis child who didn't necessarily understand why I was in that dressing room. How, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. as leadership in theaters, do you address that? Is kind of what I'm trying to yeah. get at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wish I had a better answer than listening and talking. Um, but I, I really like that's that that's where it starts. Um, and I think for the company, it's a lot of listening and mm -hmm. making sure that whatever we're saying um, uh, is translated in the way we intended back um, mm -hmm. and that it's a really reciprocal conversation because um, we can make a lot of assumptions about things, a lot of assumptions um, all the time. Um, yeah, it's just, it's constantly being open to, because um, this is, um, I mean, we're human, as humans, we're ever evolving. Everything we're doing is evolving all the time. We can't just, the decisions we made five years ago are not gonna be the right decisions right now. And that's with everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and you, I, I, I'm giving the listening and talking answer too, which I didn't notice that it's not necessarily the most helpful. I know. Um, but I think uh, <coughs> it's also about educating myself and using my cis privilege to open that conversation and to have that conversation not relying on the trans actor who's in the dressing room with the cis child to have the conversation and deliver the education. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, 
we have thought of a lot about that in race and our white privilege and are also now really thinking about that in terms of our cis privilege. Um, and so I don't always do it the most eloquently. <laughs> I might, you know, sort of um, not uh, have the greatest expertise, but it's important, I think, to, to hold space to that conversation and then not sort of put the burden on queer and trans folks who are part of a project. I love the thread in this conversation about kind of wading into the unknown and, 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 and making mistakes along the way, that that's, and also, you know, educating yourself, um, but letting yourself uh, make those mistakes and learning from them, I think it's really, really important. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll wrap up, if anyone else in the audience is. Yeah, Dory? Yeah, um, I guess I, uh, how are y'all, um, personally holding yourself accountable to doing these things, but also like uh, further conversations, but also taking like actionable steps, and also like what are, what are your own personal accountability systems? I think that's an important one for me, um, because I think it's really easy to say things and not do them. Other than my Midwestern sense of guilt, <laughs> the, one of the things that we um, have started to do is um, compile like a list of questions that we've received or um, document like conversations that we've had in the past so that we can use them going forward as a tool to um, stop an awkward conversation from happening or supersede it needing to happen in the first place. Um, so we're, I know, we're building a lot of our practices, but um, when we're thinking about um, things like the venues that we're visiting or um, the way that we built an audition notice, um, basically we take the lens that we see the world through and make sure that we're applying it every time so that every time that we have a meeting making a decision, it's like, hey, what does our mission say? Why is that important? How do we utilize that here? Which is actually something Sarah told us when we were first getting started. Is live by the mission. What does your mission say? Um, and uh, bring it into every discussion. Um, bring it into meetings and casting decisions. And um, bring it into the like dressing room fittings with your cast. Bring it into... I don't know, every room, just a room, any room, all the rooms, yes. <laughs> Streets too. <laughs> I think it's about seeing work. I mean, I'm wearing, answering my artistic hat, I guess, at the time, but it's just like seeing work, going and seeing the work that's being created, seeing what artists are doing, familiarizing yourself. Um, that's where I find myself holding most accountable. Like, am I always seeing the same kind of plays? Am I always seeing work by the same kind of person? And how do I make sure I'm not falling into that rut? Or just even just aesthetics, like falling into seeing the work that I enjoy and making sure I'm actually educating myself on the breadth of work that there is so that the programming can be more effective. Um. Uh, for, for me, it's um, remembering that, I mean, like, I don't know, like I said before, because I'm trans, like, it just kind of happens because I, like, cis people make me uncomfy. Um, <laughs> But it's it's remem for me it's it's about remembering um, to not um, like both for like my sanity and for like the, the the person I want to put into the world um, remembering that like that's not all there is to me and that I need to be doing just as much work for all the other things that I don't feel like troubled by um, and like really making sure that those are just as um, important to me as the things that direct that directly affect my identity. Yeah, I th I'll throw out one thing, um, is that um, not judging all the projects that we do, the success of the projects that we do, just on finances and, um, uh, well, just on finances a lot of times, that's the only way we, we judge success of uh, projects, but um, putting out um, really specific um, value-driven statements and then measuring ourselves against them at the end of a project. Um, we do that in two ways. One is internally, um, really being very hard on ourselves and challenging ourselves about whether or not we did that, but also asking the people we're bringing into the space, um, uh, artists, uh, audiences, everybody, like, did we, we set out to do this? Did you feel like we accomplished that? Um, and really, um, it, we are by no means, um, by no means good, great, 
perfect whatever you want to say about any of this. Um, but I do see, I think the thing that, um, so I've been with the company for 20 years and I, I think the thing that's kept me going is I have seen change and progress, whether or not it's um, uh, internally as a community, whatever it is, even if it's tiny, I, I've seen things move along. Um, and if I stop seeing that move along, then we have a, we have a I mean, we have lots of problems. Um, it's moving too slow, everything's moving too slow. Uh, but um, yeah, just making sure that there's at least some little uh, uptick on the dial. Great. Well, thank you to our panelists. <laughs> and thank you to our audience. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you want to uh, keep following what Gender Explosion's up to, check us out on Stage Source. Um, we're going to be putting out some new materials and dreaming up some new stuff. So, thanks everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.